Hello, and welcome to episode 22 of Awesome Astronomy. Now much more certain of inflation and wondering what its alternate selves are doing across the multiverse. For this is an episode that, unlike its distant, red-shifted ancestors, now sits in a universe that contains evidence of gravitational waves, perhaps the biggest discovery humanity has made since the last biggest discovery it made, and certainly bigger than the one before. Bigger than Elvis? Bigger. Wow. Mm. Now, Newton said that he was standing on the seashore looking at the pebbles while the great ocean of truth lay undiscovered. And joining me, sitting on the dock of a bay, watching the tide roll away, is of course, Ralph. Hello. Well, we have a packed show ahead, with not one interview, but two. Uh, We have evidence from the streets of London that people quite like astronomy. A five-minute concept, questions and answers, and of course we toss you puny earthlings a few scraps from the table when we announce the winner of our European Southern Observatory prize draw. So Ralph, it's been a busy few weeks. Yes, it has. It's been a big month in amateur and professional astronomy in March. We had a really big discovery that validates Einstein again, Again. strengthens the evidence for the Big Bang and cosmic inflation. We had the aurora that made its way to more southerly climbs so that more people could observe it. That one took us by surprise. As they always do, um, you'll be talking more about that in the news. I will, yes. And we also had National Astronomy Week where we set up some telescopes in busy places in London to show people in many cases their first ever views of the Moon and Jupiter. And we were lucky enough to get a good week weather-wise, so we had almost uninterrupted views all evening. Yeah, we decided to uh, set up a Marble Arch one night, uh, and then later in the week we set up outside the Globe Theatre opposite St Paul's Cathedral. Uh, It was really incredible. Yeah, it, it really was. I don't know what I was expecting, but it was far better than I think either of us could have imagined. You almost forget that initial visceral reaction you get when you see the craters of the moon or Jupiter as a disk with cloud details on it for the first time. So it was beautiful to witness hundreds of people getting that mm. first view and hearing that sharp inhalation of breath and squeals of delight. And a few profanities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were a few, weren't there? And that's because they were clearly having a whale of a time, as we were too. And we got so many questions about the size of Jupiter in relation to the Earth, what caused the craters on the Moon, a few even asking us if it was a picture stuck to the lens because it looked so good. But we did get a few about astrology. We had a Star of Bethlehem <laughs> question, and even an Electric Universe one, but oh. we just battered those away for Damien to answer in his diplomatic way. But it does show that people who've never taken an interest in astronomy before can really get enthused with just a look through a scope and take an immediate interest in astronomy and learning more about it. And astronomy is the gateway drug to science, so we were doing our bit for science too. Yeah, and and this is how it sounded. Put your eye to the eyepiece. Wow. I've never ever seen that for myself before. It's beautiful, isn't it? Amazing. We've seen photographs, but to see it real is different. Oh, goodness. Oh, my goodness. That's incredible. Oh, woo! I can't believe this. Whoa! Oh, man. (laughs) Jesus. That is wicked. You can see the craters and everything. Oh, wow. Bella. Oh, God. <laughs> Whoa. Did we call that one? Whoa. You see the craters? Oh, my God. That's beautiful. Beautiful, Ooh, isn't it? Yeah. It, the craters. It's really, it's unbelievable. It's amazing. So you go and have a look through that one now, and then you, yeah, your you? friend can look through this one. So you get two views. That one will probably be better, yeah. <laughs> go around, go around that side. This black knob on the top there. Just roll that between your finger and thumb, okay. and you'll get it into focus. Wow, that's really cool. I guess this isn't the best spot for the storm region. No, but the moon and Jupiter will look like this They're wherever you are. You don't need dark skies for those. Do you want to take a look at the moon? Yeah. If you just put your eye to the eyepiece there. Yeah. Oh my word. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh gosh. Well, you can see those craters so beautifully. Uh, and the, the, the boundary between the light and the dark. We're looking at the Sea of Crises. The Sea of Crises. Crises. 
Can you guys see you guys to come out and do this? Well, yeah, we want to show people to yeah. the skies. Not many yeah. people look through telescopes. No, exactly. Yeah. It's incredible, isn't it? It's amazing. Oh, wow. What is it? It's a moon, darling. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, uh, I mean, piece this of is cheese. maybe uh, look where the telescope's pointed. Wow. So you really can see those craters, yeah, which no, we... Laura no, no, and no, no, I would love to... <laughs> And the smallest crater that you can see, or the smallest craters that you can see, they're about the size of London. <laughs> That's weird, I don't understand that. That's, I can't get my mind around it. That's so cool. <laughs> Thanks very much. You're welcome. Thanks so much, thank you. I, um, I heard you comparing the smaller craters to the size of London there. Um, did, you, did you steal that line from me? Yeah, I did. It was such a good line, though. I overheard you say it that night, so I stole it, and people loved hearing it. So, yeah, nice recycled moon fact. Mm. Cool. So if you've got a scope yourself and you live in a town or city, we would really recommend getting a few friends together, setting up a scope or two in a town square or a busy area when the moon's up, and let people take a look. Yeah, and it's a great treat for you as well, because you'll really enjoy showing people the moon or a planet, and because it was so much fun, I think we're going to do it again, aren't we? Uh, yeah, I think we probably will. Yeah, and we'll maybe yeah. do a few uh, a few more random ones, uh, let people know about it on Twitter yeah. and Facebook, and we'll pick out some nice locations where there's going to be plenty of people around to do it again, I think. I think so. I think so. I enjoyed it. Yeah, so let's keep an eye out on that. So, we've already mentioned a big discovery this month, and it should come as no surprise to anyone interested in astronomy, but we're going to mould the show around this one. Yeah, the real biggie. Uh, if I said gravitational waves, the big bang and inflation theory, all appear to have been confirmed. Anyone interested in astronomy will know how big this discovery really is. Yeah, and well, let's keep the momentum going on this and other exciting space discoveries this month and jump straight into the news. So in some respects, this is one of those pivotal moments that fill professional astronomers with joy and can really excite the public too. And if Arthur Eddington seeing a gravitational lensing effect during a solar eclipse in 1919 can be seen as the prologue to testing Einstein's general theory of relativity, then this discovery can justifiably be seen as the prologue, or at least the beginning of the prologue, because it seems to validate a number of crucial cosmological theories. But to explain this better and to pick the bones out of this landmark discovery, we're going to be joined by Jenny Millard, who's an astrophysics student at Cardiff University, and Seb Khan, a PhD student also at Cardiff University, and Seb's research in binary black hole systems in the context of gravitational wave astronomy. Cool. So welcome to Awesome Astronomy, guys. Hi. Hey, guys. Thanks for having us. So first off, Jenny, did I overstate that in my introduction there, or is this discovery really that exciting for professional astronomers? It is exciting because they've actually found gravitational waves or they found evidence for them. They haven't found them directly, but they've got definite evidence for them now, which is something we didn't have before. So the reason why we know it's gravitational waves is because we have our theory of, of gravity, general relativity, that Einstein gave us in the early 1900s. And what you do is you make a prediction using this theory and then you go out and test your predictions against observations. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what they did. They made a prediction using, okay, it had other fancy things such as inflation in there, but the prediction matches the observations and the prediction was that gravitational waves was what was causing the, the, the B-mode polarization. And how do we know that, we, that this is gravitational waves? Because people have been looking for these for quite a while and with various different methods. Well, they found it to five sigma, some are coating seven, some are coating five. Sorry, can I just stop you there and just ask you what you mean by sigma? Um, sigma is the error you go by when you find values. So if you've got an error of one sigma, it's pretty pants. It's a really massive error. <laughs> so yeah, your values aren't very accurate. Um, you go to two sigma, that's good. Three sigma is great, but really scientists are after five sigma. And the more sigma you get, the lower your error is, so the more accurate your results are, and the more accurate the better. So where are we at the moment then with this this um, this detection by the, uh, the researchers from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics? So they're currently, well, it's been reported between five and seven sigma, seven sigma being the better, the smaller error. An error of that size means that they've definitely, definitely found something. They've definitely found gravitational waves in that patch of sky that they looked at, but it's not been applied to the rest of the sky yet, and this is where we've got to be a bit careful. 
Yeah, that, how, how much of the sky are we talking about? This, what, what's this instrument actually looked at? Yeah, so the instrument actually looked at a patch of sky in the southern hemisphere, which is about 100 degrees across and about 20 degrees in height. So it, it's a small fraction of the sky, but it is still a fairly large fraction. It's still a fra fairly large patch of the sky, but it's, it's a small in comparison to the whole sky, for sure. And what is the signal that they've found there? Sorry, I don't mean as in gravitational waves. I mean, what is it that they've looked at that lets them know that they've seen a gravitational wave? So they've been looking at the cosmic microwave background radiation. And within that, they have found polarizations. And it's those polarizations that reveal the presence of gravitational waves. Because without the gravitational waves, you wouldn't have these polarizations, which they found, which is basically what polarization is is when you have light that's orientated in different directions, that's all polarization is. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you go and see a 3D movie, if you put your 3D glasses on and you look at your friend who's got 3D glasses on, they'll look black because you've got oppositely polarized lenses. So it's only letting light through in one direction. Mm -hmm. Then the other lens is at 90 degrees to it. So then they totally cancel each other out, which is why if you put two 3D glasses next to each other, both lenses will look black, put one upside down, and you'll be able to see straight through them. So were they particularly looking for patterns that had been theorized in the cosmic microwave background, which I should say is the light, the afterglow of the Big Bang? Sure. So the light from the cosmic microwave background, the CMB, it could either be not polarized at all, meaning that kind of all the photons coming from all directions have sort of random polarization, so they all cancel each other out. Or they could be uh, polarized in some way, and normally how you get something that's kind of all polarized in some way is that something has, has affected it and caused it to be. And so what they did was they were they're looking at photons, light from the cosmic microwave background, and the, the, the light is either polarized or it's, it's not polarized, basically. If it's not polarized, then you've got kind of all the light with all the random polarization, which all kind of cancel each other out and leave no net polarization. But what you can do is you can you can you can look at the light and there's there's two kind of theorized polarization modes and they're kind of called the E mode and the B mode polarization. And so the E mode is predicted and has been found. That was found a long time ago. And these can happen or are uh, created by so-called density fluctuations. And these are the quantum fluctuations which were the seeds of the galaxies and which grew in size as a result of inflation. But then you have the other polarization, the B mode, which is theorized to only to be created by uh, gravitational wave perturbations. So this is why the B mode is especially important. And that B mode's been detected, has and, it? And this is what has been claimed to be detected yet yeah, at a significance of five sigma. So whilst they found it to five or seven sigma in that patch of sky, we've got to be careful because they have only found it in that patch of sky. They haven't yet put it across the whole sky. So they might have just found something that they think is gravitational waves but it might not actually be gravitational waves. Until they can apply it to the whole sky, you just got to keep that little bit of cynicism. But they'll get the data from Planck, they think. Although Planck wasn't designed for finding polarizations, but they're thinking that because the signal is so strong, they should be able to find it from the Planck data, which is going to be released in October, I think. Certainly by the end of the year. So, Seb, what does this mean for your research into gravitational waves? How will cosmology research change now that you've been shown something that confirms accepted theories in cosmology? Well, in terms of my direct research, it, it doesn't really affect it all that much. It's, it, can only, it only strengthens the gravitational wave research as a whole and cosmology as a whole. It in no way kind of diminishes the other, other areas of research into gravitational waves. But now, now the data has been released, I think... Well, we see every, every day there's, there's a new paper every single day that has done some analysis, some new analysis on the BICEP2 results and claiming new theories or ruling out other theories of, of uh, strange cosmologies. So this, this data is very fresh and there's a, there's a lot of potential in it. Okay, so multiverse. Could you explain what this shows us about that? Well, okay, this is a difficult subject. It's, well, you, you're kind of in two categories. You're kind of in the... The, the physicists who believe in kind of multiverse theories and physicists who don't believe in multiverse theories, mainly because it's difficult to get any testable predictions from multiverse theories. And is there anything that comes out of this BICEP2 data that makes us think that perhaps, well, that maybe sways the argument one way or the other? I think it kind of neither confirms nor denies multiverse theories. I mean, this, it's still up in the air. Yeah, it doesn't confirm or deny it. 
But basically, if I think the argument goes is that if, if we're not in a kind of special place in the universe, or if our universe isn't a special place, then if one part of space underwent inflation to create a universe, then another part of space could go, undergo inflation as well and kind of create another universe. Right, so who is going to see actual live gravitational waves first? Do you have a favorite experiment you are, you're backing to get in there first? Well, there's the collaboration which I'm involved with, which is the uh, LIGO Scienti Scientific Collaboration, the LSC. And so LIGO stands for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. These are ground-based gravitational wave detectors, which are our observatories to detecting kind of live gravitational waves on the Earth. And so these detectors are actually down for upgrades, and they'll be online by the end of next year. And th it's quite a long road to get to the kind of advanced detector era, where these detectors will have much, much greater sensitivity than before. But we're, we're predicting that by the, end of, by the end of the decade, by 2019, 2020, then we'll be seeing detections here on Earth. So you think that LIGO will have the potential to be able to detect these before perhaps LISA gets commissioned and, and, and flown to go and look for uh, gravitational waves in a similar way, but with a much wider baseline out in space? Yeah, sure. So ELISA is incredible, but it, it actually it's funded by ESA now, I believe. And it has a launch date. Unfortunately, it's something like 2030 or 2034, so a very long time away. But that will, if the theory is correct, that will certainly make detections. It will actually be, make so many detections that we won't be able to disentangle them very well. Well, we'll have to work hard to disentangle the uh, the detections. Whereas with LIGO, we're expecting to make you know one detection every now and again. But it's just because the gravitational waves are so weak and buried in the noise. But they're different gravitational waves, aren't they? Yeah, sure. So LIGO are kind of, is kind of looking at uh, binary neutron stars, which are in spiraling together and merging to form either a hypermassive neutron star or a black hole at the end, or a binary black hole system, which is also in spiraling and merging, and they'll create, as a final state, uh, just a bigger black hole, which is spinning. But with ELISA, they are going to be sensitive to much lower frequencies than we can ever achieve on Earth. And the lower frequencies correspond to things like supermassive black holes, kind of at the center of galaxies, which are merging and colliding as well. So if money was no object, what experiment would you build to prove the existence of gravity gravitational waves? Well, I think ELISA is, is going to be one of the key players in this, actually. That is certainly going to have the sensitivity enough to detect gravitational waves. But there's, there's kind of a more, more interesting kind of fun theoretical answer to the question, is that if you consider the predicted quanta of gravity, the graviton, and if that's possible to be detected. And there's a physicist who goes by the name of Freeman Dyson who gave an interesting talk a couple of years ago. And he, kind of, he estimates, you know, hypothetically, if you could detect gravitons at all. And so he made the hypothesis that, okay, if you could, if you had the whole mass of the Earth to play with, to use that as a graviton detector, okay, this is the classic theorist just going completely overboard. And if you were trying to detect gravitons from the sun, and if you observed it over the whole remaining lifetime of the sun, which is approximately 5 billion years, then he claims that you detect on the order of four gravitons. So we don't think that this is something that we're going to be able to detect through the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. I think certainly not, you know, I think you, it, it requires extraordinary amounts of energy and also gravity is just such a, an incredibly weak force mm -hmm. that it doesn't like to play with anyone else. It's very, it doesn't interact very well with anybody. Well, thanks for joining us to add an extra dimension to this news story, Seb. And where can our listeners find you? Uh, thanks for having me. It's been great. Thanks a lot. Well, you can catch me on Twitter. I have a Twitter. It's at uh, No Work Wednesday. <laughs> Because I don't work on Wednesdays. Good name. <laughs> yeah, and I also have a blog. It goes by the same name, No Work Wednesdays. On, you, you can just find it on my Twitter. Go to, go to my Twitter, No Work Wednesdays. Yeah. And thanks for that too, Jenny. And we'll see you again in Astro Camp soon. Yes, you will. Looking forward to it. It's going to be fab. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. See you guys. Bye. And we have more on gravitational waves later in the program. Um, so we've got some more good news for cosmologists this month. Are we homing in on dark matter too? Well, it's probably too early to say, but we do have a tantalising possibility from a team of Harvard astronomers led by Tansu Dalen. Now, because dark matter is theorised to be made of yet-to-be-observed particles, widely known as weakly interacting massive particles, or WIMPs, that bizarrely behave like their own antiparticles, they should annihilate themselves, creating a shower of normal particles, such as electrons and their antimatter equivalent, positrons. And in doing so, they should emit gamma rays in this first annihilation, as well as a secondary annihilation when those electrons and positrons come into contact with each other. Does that make sense? Probably not, but these gamma rays 
as we heard in last month's interview with Professor Carol Mundell, can be detected, and in space the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope creates whole sky surveys of gamma ray sources and emissions. Yeah, so as dark matter accounts for five times more matter in the universe than everything we can see, um, that should mean we see dark matter everywhere, Um, but it's not as simple as that. No, if it were, we'd have this big astronomy riddle sewn up years ago, but the Harvard team thinks it's a case of subtracting noise from signal in the Fermi Space Telescope data. So they've gone through the Fermi data and removed the known gamma ray sources produced by pulsars and think much of what they're left with is a consequence of dark matter. They even extrapolate this to put the mass of dark matter particles in the 31 to 40 giga electron volts range, and that's something that the LHC at CERN should be able to probe further. But this is quite a leap, and it just seems a bit too simple. It also seems to require there to be no pulsars sitting away from the galactic centre. It's in these regions where the gamma ray sources they think they're seeing hallmarks of dark matter exist. And that seems improbable, but it's certainly testable. So we'll get an answer to this one way or the other, undoubtedly. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. I mean, you know how sceptical I am at times Mm. about this. Um, I can't wait to see the results. So uh, now... What have we got next up? Um, oh, I missed it. But many across the continent didn't, and of course, I'm talking about the aurora over Europe. Yeah, for people in Europe, there was a really good, strong aurora display on the 27th of February, so we didn't quite get into last month's podcast because we recorded it just a little bit before then. And this aurora reached as far south as Moscow in Russia, Bristol in England, and Berlin in Germany. And this was caused by an X-class solar flare that hurled highly charged particles into space and skimmed the Earth, sparking impressive curtains of light. And some images from Northern Ireland even showed a rare and beautiful combination of red, green and blue bands. And it was great to see just so many people taking images of it with with pretty much standard cameras, especially since such a rich auroral display is quite uncommon so far south. And in fact, if it was cloudless for any mid or northern European listeners, the chances are you'd have been able to see this northern lights display for yourself. And maybe you did, because loads of people took to Twitter to show others what they were seeing, and it was reported in all the newspapers the following day. You know, such was the quality of the display and the images that were taken. But the downside here was that a UK daily newspaper appears to have printed some of our listeners' images of the Aurora without permission. Newspaper in inverted copy. Exactly. But the Daily Mail's a rag that we as malevolent Martians, prejudiced against all races on Earth, hell-bent on breaking down the fabric of society and creating an atmosphere of mistrust, fear and outrage to promote podcast downloads, really appreciate. Except when they take advantage of one of our own. Yeah, we're not fond of humanity on the whole, but we do have a paternalistic fondness for our listeners and we don't like it when they get upset at, say, a Daily National newspaper. Newspaper in inverted comments. Exactly, using copyrighted images from their Flickr account without permission or crediting their article, and make no attempt to contact the owner for permission nor credit the images to her. And breaking the rules, cheating good honest people, ignoring any attempts to get justice, that's, well, it's just the sort of behaviour you expect to read about foreigners in that newspaper. Newspaper in inverted commas, Paul. Exactly. And one of our listeners, Wendy Clark, who's at Twinkle Spin a Lot on Twitter, was naturally quite upset about her images being used by a newspaper in inverted commas exactly, whose politics are opposed to hers. So we wanted to add our voices to this and make our own very small mark in calling them out in our own small way because, well, we've got thousands of listeners and Twitter followers and we wanted to join in with a whole bunch of tweets that were questioning the Daily Mail's policy on plagiarism. And where has it got us all, Wendy? So far, nowhere, Paul. Absolutely nowhere. As a race of malevolent Martians, blah blah blah, 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 we know that dictatorial and malignant forces never admit they've done anything wrong, and they never apologise. But after ignoring her attempts to contact them by Twitter and email, I suspect the letters from a lawyer may have more of an effect, though. And I say letters because it transpires that the same images were used without permission by another newspaper. Newspaper in inverted commas? Yeah, I think so, don't you? Hmm. Let me, let me take a look and see who it was. Yeah, yeah. But at least they apologised and compensated Wendy for the use of her images. But I'm happy to say that our listeners are far too discerning to read either newspaper and inverted commas exactly. And Wendy actually had to be told about the infringements by friends and family. And it's not as if that was the Daily Fail's only infraction this month either. No, unfortunately not. But their other astronomy-related facepalm moment this month was one that I'm glad to say got University College London, Chris Lintart and even the Royal Astronomical Society speaking out against what seemed like a suggestion from the Daily Mail 
that the BBC had only chosen Maggie Adderin Pocock and Dr Hirana Pierist to contribute to the BBC programme Newsnight because of their ethnicity. Both Maggie and Hirana have doctorates. Maggie holds an MBE for services to science education. She's an engineer who's worked on instruments for the Gemini Telescope in Chile and now works in instrumentation development for the James Webb Space Telescope. That's the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. She also hosts TV programmes that include the Documentary Horizon programme and the BBC's flagship show, The Sky at Night. Hiranya holds astronomy-related degrees from Princeton and Cambridge. She's a cosmologist at University College London who's been involved in the WMAP and Planck collaborations to probe the cutting edge in the same field of cosmology as the BICEP2 team that she was commenting on. So why the Daily Mail assume everyone is as interested and hung up on race as they appear to be, I don't know. But when I get my science news, I like it to be from experts, and those two ladies more than qualify for that description. Did you enjoy that rant? did it was quite cathartic i should have a rant every week uh, i think you do actually <laughs> hmm. good okay then what's next uh dark matter and dinosaurs oh eight-year-olds everywhere exploding with sheer joy the perfect combination <laughs> isn't it <laughs> this one's a bit speculative but we both like it so some research reported in the new scientist magazine suggests that the dinosaurs may have been killed in part by dark matter now, I'll prefix this by saying it's quite tenuous. Anything involving dark matter usually is because we don't know what it is. But we can't pass on a dinosaur and dark matter story. So to recap, dark matter is this placeholder name we give to a substance that we've not detected but has been indirectly observed due to its gravitational pull inside galaxies and dense star clusters. And a web of dark matter appears to exist in and between galaxies and actually prevents them from flying apart as they spin around the supermassive black holes in their centres. But as to what dark matter is, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN is still our best current hope of finding out, despite the research from Tansu Dalen's Harvard-Smithsonian team we spoke about earlier. But a recent model created by more astronomers from Harvard, Professor Lisa Randall and Assistant Professor Matt Rees, showed there may be a ring of dark matter in our Milky Way galaxy, like a halo that lies parallel to the disk of the galaxy. Now we know that our solar system not only orbits the centre of the galaxy, but also gently bobs up and down in its orbit like riding a wave around the galactic centre. And every 35 million years, our solar system gets a greater than average bombardment from comets. Something disturbs the stable orbit of the distant icy ring of debris around our solar system in the Oort cloud. Previous guesses at this suggest our solar system rises and lowers into more dense regions of stars, gas and dust within our spiral arm every 35 million years, that being a more established hypothesis for the cause of these perturbations in the orbits of comets. But we now have this competing dark matter theory, and it's one that can be tested because the European Space Agency's wondercraft Gaia should be able to see the motions of billions of stars in our galaxy with such precision that it should witness the presence of a gravitationally attractive ring of dark matter, if it's there. So if this ring of dark matter does exist and does make the orbits of some Oort cloud comets unstable, does this fit with the giant impacts that hit Mexico 66 million years ago killing off the dinosaurs? Well, on first glimpse it would seem not, as there wasn't a passage of the solar system through this proposed dark matter disk exactly 66 million years ago. But the model does match with the age of impact spikes observed from craters on the ground all around the world. And we know that some long period comets from the Oort cloud can take millions of years to reach the inner solar system, so the numbers don't have to match exactly. Now I can hear you all saying that surely we know it was an asteroid that killed the dinosaurs because it had to be iron or rocky to hit Chicxulub in Mexico with enough force and to deposit that smoking gun in the form of the Chicxulub geological layer of the extremely rare element iridium that comes from asteroids. Surely we know it was an asteroid that killed the dinosaurs because it had to be iron or rocky to hit the Chicxulub in Mexico with enough force and deposit the smoking gun in the form of Chicxulub geological layer of the extremely rare element iridium that comes from the asteroid. But this isn't the first suggestion of a cometary impactor. Just last year, Professors Jason Moore and Mukmal Sharma from Dartmouth College in the United States published research that had taken another look at the iridium concentrations and also looked at another rare element on Earth, osmium. And they found that the concentrations were much lower than would have been the case if a large asteroid had been the culprit. But crucially, in keeping with the levels expected from a high-velocity comet impact large enough to survive passage through the atmosphere intact. So we don't just have to worry about asteroids buzzing us every month or so, we've got comets to unsettle us too, so is that all there is, or is there more? And more, I'm afraid, we've discovered a new planet. That'll upset the astrologers. 
I doubt it, they're making it all up as they go along anyway, but this minor planet evaded detection so well because it's twice the distance of Pluto, 80 times further from the Sun than the Earth, and it's been called 2012 VP113 until everyone's satisfied that it is actually there and the International Astronomical Union give it a formal name, and that'll probably go out to a public vote. So this object's an icy body 450 kilometres across. But interestingly, when astronomers plotted the orbits of this body, along with Pluto, other Kuiper Belt objects, and the Sedna, they found orbital issues that aren't accounted for by any other models. But it would fit with a super-Earth-sized planet 250 times the Sun-Earth distance away, or an even larger planet further out. So while I think we'll ultimately find that there isn't such a large body out there, I hate to say it, but that... Planet X nonsense might turn out to be real after all, though purely by luck rather than knowledge on the part of those that peddle such rumours. Oh no, it's Nibiru all over again. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, nice to find more objects out there, but as Planet X, uh, I'm keeping that one in the sceptical file for now, I think. that's um, So finally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, finding a bizarre discovery from an international team of astronomers using a whole barrage of telescopes. Yeah, another discovery in the outer solar system, which, as we know, is a very large and empty place, but we're certainly doing a lot of probing around there, as that last news story will attest. And in addition to the two main belts of icy objects in the outer solar system, the Kuiper belt beyond the orbit of Neptune and the Oort cloud, a vast ring of icy debris that stretches out to a quarter of the distance to our next star, we also find a third category of objects that sits closer in, in erratic or unstable orbits between Saturn and Neptune, and these are called centaurs. So it's always exciting when we make a discovery out there too, because these objects are always small, they're always far away, and exhibit wildly different properties. Some are like minor planets, others like asteroids, and some even outgas and have properties like comets. And what's been discovered is that the minor planet Centaur, Cariclo, just 250 kilometres wide, is behaving like a Saturn in miniature, because an international team have seen dips in light as Cariclo passed in front of a distant star, and these dips in light are consistent with the Centaur having two dense and narrow but clearly distinct rings three kilometres wide and separated by a nine kilometre gap. And this is the first object anywhere near as small as this to have rings, and it's theorised that they were caused by a collision that left debris orbiting Curriculo. It's now thought that the tiny minor planet about the width of Switzerland may also have moons. Well, thanks for that. It'll be interesting to see what follow-up observations show. And now it's time for our five-minute concept where we explore a long-term mystery in astronomy that was only solved once we decided that the sun was at the centre of things. There was a golden age of Islamic astronomy between the 8th and 15th centuries. A flourishing of empirical observation and innovation unmatched until the Renaissance. While European Christian scholars of the same period argued about when was the correct time to celebrate Easter or the nature of angels, Muslim astronomers were building great observatories and mapping the heavens. Of course, the reasons driving both were generally questions of religion, and in the case of the great Islamic observatories, the correct time to pray was of the greatest interest. They had a mystery, though. While the stars and sun appeared to be decodable to empirical study, there was something of crucial bearing to prayer times that was a real puzzle, so much so that it's even mentioned in the Quran. At certain times of the year, particularly spring and autumn, there is a false dawn. Looking to the east in the morning, the sky lightens before sunrise, a phenomenon most have witnessed. But for those who watch the dawn closely, especially in a dark sky, you may witness a dawn before the dawn. A bright triangle of sky filling the eastern horizon, brightening as if the sun is beginning its daily appearance. But actually, the true dawn may be many minutes or more away. For any religion that has an eye on the time, this false dawn could cause metaphysical danger. It was a phenomenon that the time defied explanation and was a danger to be wary of when setting your daily timetable for prayers a pitfall that could lead you into false worship. In many ways, it is unsurprising that the false dawn or zodiacal light, as it would become to be known, would go unexplained for so long, as what is the crucial piece of information needed to begin an explanation was missing. The late Renaissance observation made famous by Copernicus and subsequently Galileo and Kepler that the sun, and not earth, is at the centre of things as we see them. It is interesting to consider that while previous explanations of planetary movement work to a point and allow a model that predict observation, 
There is nothing that can seriously offer us an explanation for the false dawn until we accept the heliocentric solar system. Of course, the heliocentric view of space is not as new as we think, and while Nicolaus Copernicus has his name on the front cover, the idea is one with an origin in the 3rd century BC. Aristarchus of Samos, astronomer and mathematician, a man who was, as it turned out, 18 centuries ahead of his time, a record that must be pretty difficult to beat. Not only did he present a sun-centred universe, but a solar system with planets in correct order of distance. Perhaps the first humans have in his mind a picture of the solar system that actually exists. Not only that, but Aristarchus also put forward the idea that the stars were far more distant than his contemporaries assumed. Perhaps Aristarchus was the first human with anything like a true picture of the universe in his imagination. But it was an imagination accused of impiety for suggesting such a radical view, and for the next 18 centuries the world was at the centre of a universe filled with epicycles and spheres, and one where false dawns were just one of life's mysteries in the vastness of empty space. Today we often think of space as empty, and as good a description of nothingness as to be had, and to a degree that is correct. Compared to any man-made attempt at nothingness and void, space has us beat hands down. But space isn't empty, even at the incredible levels of nothingness we find hard to recreate, and it was a thought that occurred to one of the giants of Enlightenment astronomy, Giovanni Cassini. He who discovered four moons of Saturn, co-discovered the Great Red Spot, and first described what we now call the Cassini Division. It was Cassini who, in 1683, proposed an explanation for the false dawn, that space was not empty at all. The world had been heliocentric for very few years. Galileo had been arrested for pushing the view and insulting the Pope into the bargain just 50 years before, and Kepler's laws of planetary motion had yet to reach their 70th anniversary. Everything in the solar system is in orbit. Moons orbit planets, as we witness every 27 days in an example of the only piece of solar system mechanics that the ancient world got right. But for everything else, the Sun is king. Sweeping out great ellipses, the planets orbit the Sun in periods that vary from a few days to centuries but all obeying the observations of Kepler, what he called celestial physics. Every ellipse has two foci, with one being the Sun, and can all be divided into four equal areas centred on the same. Each planet, as it makes its way around the Sun, passes through each of the four sections in an equal time, slowing or speeding up as necessary. The Earth does this, Jupiter does this, even distant Sedina does this. Such was the brilliance of Kepler's work in unpicking the hidden beauty of Tycho Brahe's vast volumes of observational data. Why this should be so does not begin to be explained until Isaac Newton published the Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica, possibly one of the greatest and most important pieces of human thought ever put to paper. In it, Newton lays the foundation for modern physics and establishes order in the universe. Amazingly, if it had not been for the curiosity of another astronomer, Edmund Halley, the Principa would never have been written. Newton, having created it for his own intellectual amusement, and then lost it. Halley, curious as to why Kepler's law should be so, asked Newton if he had any ideas. What an idea! Using the Principia and the explanation of gravity it contained, Halley went on to predict and explain the behaviour of comets and tamed what had been one of astronomy's great unexplained phenomena. He showed that they orbit the Sun just as the planets do, and can be predicted and recorded just as any other celestial object. No more heavenly wanderers, just another of the Sun's elliptical children sweeping out their equal areas and leaving a trail of dust as they pass through the inner solar system. The dust of comets. It is everywhere in the inner solar system. Tiny particles, some in streams that we pass through and witness as meteor showers. Much of it, though, concentrated in a lens-shaped cloud around the Sun itself. Typically, micrometers across, and like everything else, it is all in orbit around the Sun. Over time, it slowly spirals into the Sun, or if collisions make the particles smaller than 10 micrometers, they blow away on the solar winds. This cloud is constantly replenished from the dust in comet tails, dust from the collision of asteroids, tiny fragments, the stuff of planets collected in the inner solar system, in what we call the interplanetary dust cloud. It perhaps demonstrates the vastness of space, that this cloud has particles so far apart, with pieces a millimetre across typically being eight kilometres distant. Yet, in the pre-dawn sky, this vast cloud of almost nothingness will absorb and reflect enough of the sun's light to deceive and perplex humanity for centuries.
OK, and for the interview, we're returning to this month's landmark discovery as Dr Chris North from Cardiff University's School of Physics and Astronomy and the BBC's Sky at Night programme returns to talk with Ralph about what else, gravitational waves and cosmology. Hi, Chris. It's good to have you back on the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So to get everybody on the same page, let's jump straight into it. And what are gravitational waves? <laughs> Uh, so gravitational waves are stretches in the fabric of space itself. So we can think of space as being made of something called, well, you can think of space time. It sounds very sci-fi. Um, <laughs> just the fabric of, of space, as it were. Uh, something that, that Einstein talked about in his general theory of relativity, which is where he sort of redefined gravity as we, as we now understand it. And one of the things that falls out of Einstein's theories are that you can have waves, ripples in space time ripples through space and these spread out throughout the universe now, now to make a gravitational wave you need some masses to be moving so so think about a, a, a wave on water if you like if, if a, you get um something floating bobbing around then you end up with ripples on the water and it's the same with gravitational waves if you get two masses in space that are moving around together uh, then you end up with ripples uh, in space time so that can be Black holes orbiting each other. It can be neutron stars orbiting each other. Uh, we, we've got very good evidence they exist from some pulsars where we see as they lose energy through radiating gravitational waves, the period of their spin slowly decreases and we can measure that very accurately and it meets all the, uh, meets all the expectations. But there's a catch. The, the stretch you see from gravitational waves is less than a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a fraction. So you see changes in lengths of about that that order. So the detectors that are down on, on Earth looking for these things uh, have laser beams going over about four kilometers, and they're looking for a stretch in that four kilometers. But they're actually looking for a change in length of less than the size of an atom. So although our detectors are really sensitive, they're really small effects, these gravitational waves, and difficult to detect. Yeah, so that's the, the direct detection of actually that these detectors will let us see a gravitational wave passing through the Earth uh, mm -hmm. at some point, hopefully in the next few years, the prediction mm -hmm. is that we'll see them, although that prediction has been around for, for quite, a, <laughs> quite a while. We've been a few years away, but it does seem that we're getting, getting closer. Um, but there are indirect ways of seeing gravitational waves. Uh, one big one is, uh, I mentioned this, this binary pulsar, two pulsars orbiting each other. As they radiate energy through gravitational waves, the orbit of this pulsar slows down slightly and we see that change in, in timing, if you like. But there's also an impact in the very early universe. Well, coming on to the early universe, could you take us through what inflation is and what the impact is? So, so inflation is a theory that was, was thought up in the 1980s but it's it's a useful theory or has, has always been a useful theory for explaining some oddities with the universe so for example why does the universe basically look the same in every single direction mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't necessarily expect it to be that way it would be perfectly acceptable without inflation for one side of the universe to be a different temperature to the other side of the universe mm -hmm. um, and we see that they're very very similar temperatures what inflation is, is inflation says that in the first tiny fraction of a second, so it's the mi a millionth of a billionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, that really is a tiny fraction, <laughs> the universe expanded by a factor of something like a million billion trillion. Or that is, in that tiny period, it doubled in size about 80 times. And the thing that people find it difficult to get their head around here is that the universe actually expands faster than the speed of light rather than things within the universe yeah. expanding faster than the speed of light. Because this is this is an expansion rate rather than a velocity of, of things moving through space. So you're right. So talking about speeds is can be a little, uh, a little tricky uh, with this kind of thing. So in fact, right now, if you go and measure the apparent speed of galaxies uh, billions of light years away, you don't have to go that far away before they appear to be moving away from us at the speed of light. And that's because this is the, the space is increasing in size by a given fraction in a certain time period. And that's not breaking any laws of physics, is it? No, there's, there's no laws of physics broken here. Now, in the, the other thing that inflation predicts is that because the universe would have gone from some almost infinitesimally small, not quite, but almost infinitesimally small point to something that's a couple of centimetres across, a few centimetres across in that tiny, tiny fraction of a second, Quantum fluctuations in that infinitesimally small point of, of space 
will have been blown up by inflation. Well, they do two things. They cause variations in the density of the universe. We see that in the cosmic microwave background uh, today. And those variations in density led to the formation of the clusters of galaxies and galaxies that we see around us. But also those quantum fluctuations, as they were blown up to much bigger sizes by this factor of a million, billion, trillion or thereabouts, um, or doubling in size 80 times, that caused gravitational waves to spread out through the universe. Mm -hmm. Now, they're incredibly low frequency gravitational waves because the frequency of the waves is not far off the uh, the age of the universe and the, the period of the waves. And so the wavelength of these waves is about the same as the size of the universe. So they'd be incredibly hard to detect directly. Uh, but they leave an imprint on the cosmic microwave background. They leave an imprint on the afterglow of the Big Bang. Well, you mentioned there about the cosmic microwave background radiation, and that's been in the news quite a bit recently. So can you tell us what that actually is? Yeah, so the, the cosmic microwave background radiation is the afterglow of the Big Bang. We see the very early universe as a soup of it was a soup of gas, very hot gas, and it was ionized. So the atoms, it was so hot, there was so much energy around, so much high energy radiation. The atoms were stripped apart. They, they hadn't, hadn't yet even formed. That was the situation for about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. The universe was, was so hot and, and dense and, and opaque, essentially. It got to a point uh, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang when it cooled enough for the first atoms to form. And so electrons met protons and formed hydrogen atoms and also got helium atoms as well. And the universe suddenly became transparent. And the light from that point in time has been spreading out through space ever since. So if we look at the most distant parts of the universe that we can, the light from those parts has been traveling to, to us for 13.8 billion years. So we're seeing those distant parts of the universe as they were 13.8 billion years ago. And we're seeing this point in the universe, this, this cosmic microwave background, this afterglow of the Big Bang, the point at which it became transparent. And we can't see any further back in time because the universe is was opaque. So we can't see what was going on at earlier times mm -hmm. or, or greater distances. But we can, there is an imprint on it from what happened during inflation. Part of that is those those ripples that they, or those, those tiny variations in density. The cosmic microwave background appears to be almost completely uniform over the entire sky. The light has been stretched uh, with the expansion of the universe by a factor of a thousand. So what was a hot visible light glow 13.8 uh, billion years ago has been stretched to a microwave glow in the sky now, which is why you get the term microwave background. Mm -hmm. So you need pretty much radio telescopes uh, to see it. And that's further evidence for the expansion of the universe, isn't it? Yeah, so there's lots of things that shows that the universe has been expanding. One is that galaxies appear to be receding away from us. Uh, but the other, the other in the 1960s uh, was that very distant galaxies look different. So that meant because we're seeing them as they were longer ago, longer ago the universe was different to the way it is now. And in fact, the cosmic microwave background is really good evidence for that because the cosmic microwave background is the proof that at really early times the universe was incredibly different from the way it is now and it was this this hot sea of uh fun of subatomic particles it's something that was actually predicted back in the the first half of the 20th century so in the 1940s there were predictions uh of that there would be this afterglow that we should be able to detect uh, there were various predictions of how how hot that glow would appear to us now um, and in the 1960s, it was found. And it really was the nail in the coffin of other theories about the, the start of the universe. So it really was the, the, the last straw for these other theories and showed that the Big Bang theory in general, the universe used to be very hot and has been expanding since, was in fact true or is in fact true. And now that we understand all these incredibly complicated conditions in the early universe, let's, let's move on to the uh, this new discovery that we're all quite excited about that the BICEP2 team discovered. Can you tell us what the BICEP2 team is and what they think they found? Well, the, the, the BICEP2 team is a team of, of scientists, mostly in North America, though there are some in, uh, in Cardiff University involved in, in, the, in the project. And they've had a telescope that's been looking at the cosmic microwave background uh, from the South Pole. Mm -hmm. uh, so the reason you go to the South Pole is because to look at these wavelengths, you need to get away from all the water vapor in our atmosphere. You need to be able to get above most of it. Now, Antarctica, despite being covered in ice, is actually very dry. Mm -hmm. There's very little moisture in the atmosphere. And in fact, the site that BICEP2 is located at, which is pretty much at the South Pole, is pretty high. So you're above a good chunk of the atmosphere. 
So that means that observing the wavelengths they need to observe is much easier. Um, so they're observing wavelengths, uh, light with a wavelength of about two millimeters. So well in the microwave regime. And they're also observing other properties of the light. Now, light doesn't just have this intensity of how bright it is. You can also think about light having an orientation. So because light is a wave traveling through space and it oscillates, it goes up and down, electric fields and magnetic fields going up and down, uh, either upwards and downwards or left and right or any other angle. Mm -hmm. Most processors actually produce light of all angles and you don't see what's called this polarization, this orientation of the light. But there are there are lots of ways of creating polarized light. So where light tends to be oscillating in one particular orientation. Now, we know that the cosmic microwave background is slightly polarized. There's a slightly preferred direction to the light. And we measure that pattern of the orientation of the light over the sky. That's certainly been done before. Is that knowledge of that through the theory or is it because of what we've seen in WMAP and Planck data on the cosmic microwave background radiation? Well, it was certainly theorized. The fact that there were regions of different density and different temperature in the microwave background means that the the light that's traveling to us from that point will be partially polarized. That mm -hmm. was theorized um, a while ago when the, when these fluctuations were first were first seen, and there was in fact the polarization was first detected. The actual experimental detection was in about the the start of the century uh, by an experiment called Daisy, and there've been a number of experiments since then that have detected this. W map and Planck being two of them, and the the Planck polarization results are due out later this year. But there's a very subtle pattern of polarization that you can see on top of that, if you look carefully enough. The, the fluctuations in, in, in density and temperature of the cosmic microwave background are about one part in 100,000. So you're looking at fractions uh, of a thousandth of a degree in terms of the temperature variations. <laughs> so that's pretty difficult. And that's just the cosmic microwave background itself. The polarization of the microwave background is about a factor of 10 lower than that. So you tend to be looking at tens of millions of a degree in in variation and then this really subtle imprint on it it's called a b mode is the name that gets uh, that gets used it's a specific pattern of polarization over the sky so you don't look at one point you look at the way it varies over the sky that specific pattern in terms of the primordial universe can only be put there from gravitational waves in inflation there are lots of other ways of creating polarization of light. Reflections create polarization. So when light comes from the sun and reflects off the road, it creates a slightly polarized light. And that's why polarized sunglasses are polarized. They can block out that reflection from the road. But an experiment, a telescope can also create spurious polarization signals and ruling them out is really difficult. What BICEP2 has found, which is this, this B mode signature for the first time, B mode signature from the early universe, we need to confirm it with at least one more experiment to know that it's not an accident, that it's not artifact in the data. And am I right in thinking that the BICEP2 telescope is also looking at just one small section of the sky, whereas we, we could do with using one of the survey telescope's data to, to back this up, that the, the whole sky is polarised in this way? Yes, yeah, so, so BICEP2 looks at about 1 40th of the sky, which is a relatively small patch. It's about 1,000 square, square degrees, which actually just goes to show quite how big the sky is. Um, but it's one tiny patch of the sky that they can observe from the South Pole. One of the reasons for observing a small patch of sky is gas and dust within our galaxy. The microwave light from the gas and dust is polarized. And so you need to be able to look at a patch of the sky where there's hardly any signal from our galaxy and remove and what signal, little signal there is, remove it from your data uh, before trying to search for these B modes. So it can only look at one small patch of the sky. And so we can, by looking at a larger fraction of the sky, Planck uh, has an advantage that it, it's got that, that larger fraction of sky. Uh, the, the advantage BICEP2 has over things like this is that because it was only looking at one small patch of the sky, it looked at that patch of the sky in much more detail uh, than Planck can look at one patch of the sky. So there's pros and cons to all these things. And we, we think we're seeing the signature of gravitational waves in there, these incredibly small and hard to detect ripples in space-time. What else does that tell us about the early universe, if these are correct? Well, one of the properties of inflation, one of the things about inflation is that it's been really good for explaining what we knew about the universe already. So it's really good at explaining why the universe seems to be the same everywhere and why the geometry of the universe is what we call flat, which basically means light travels in straight lines. But this theory predicted things that we knew already. So that doesn't really count if you're, you've, you've thought of a theory and it, it says what you already knew. So 
what inflation did, though, is it made this prediction that there would be uh, this B mode signature, this pattern of polarization in the cosmic microwave background that we should be able to detect. And now we've gone and if this result holds up, which we obviously hope it does, and it looks reasonably convincing, although it is early days, if this result holds up, then we've seen that that prediction has been satisfied, if you like. So this is good, strong evidence that inflation is in fact true. And the other thing, of course, to bear in mind that Inflation is a theory that says the universe expanded by a huge amount in a tiny fraction of a second, but it doesn't explain how or why. So it's possible that by studying this in more detail and by looking at a lot the the uh, the details of this this signature of gravitational waves, we might be able to start answering the theory of uh, what really happens and why it why it happens. For example, the gravitational waves are a prediction of of Einstein's theory of gravity, uh, general relativity. The quantum fluctuations in inflation are a part of quantum physics. And so quantum fluctuations creating gravitational waves is a merger between quantum physics and gravity. So we think this could be a window into a grand unified theory. Yeah, so this is something that we've not been able to do before. These theories don't seem to mesh very nicely. But if we can study more about what was going on in that first tiny fraction of a second, it's our only window into the energy scales you need uh, to be able to do this. So to be able to study these gravitational or the signature of gravitational waves, we might be able to get a handle on a unified theory. That's probably a long way off, but this is the way all these things start. So it could be a new, extremely exciting era in cosmology. So this is the first crossover potentially that we've seen of the quantum and the classical world. And that's, well, getting that that small window is uh, gives us a nice handle on where to look in the future. And that's really exciting. Yeah, it could mean that we're moving. We've been talking about there's talk of the last uh, few decades being the era of precision because the measurements have been getting more and more accurate. Yeah. And one of the um, uh, I was chatting to a a scientist working, one of the the lead scientists working on Planck, who was saying that the, the, the problem is that although our measurements are getting more and more precise, our theories aren't getting any more precise. For example, we don't know what 95 percent of the universe is so the idea that we understand cosmology is, is <laughs> nuts really i mean we really don't one small corner of it perhaps yeah yeah one tiny fraction so being able to study this in more detail uh, might give us a handle on some of these these theories for example it could be it could turn out that inflation the, the expansion of the first tiny fraction of a second is actually related to the dark energy that's pushing the universe apart and accelerating the expansion today but what we need now is for the theorists to come up with uh, a theory that explains what caused inflation and exactly how it created the effects that we see in the universe. And then the key thing is to make a prediction that we can go and test. Now, it might be that the prediction we can go and test is decades away from being testable just because the technology has got to advance. But again, that's nothing new. So the cosmic microwave background predicted in the 1940s discovered in the 1960s um the uh the theory of inflation uh, predicted in the early 1980s and now discovered in the 2010 so that's a 30-year delay it's not entirely surprising that we could be 40 years away from proving any of those right this this is a slow and careful process to be able to to show to discover exactly what's going on and i think that's one of the wonderful things about astronomy and cosmology in particular that that with every new exciting discovery we have, we know it's just opening the window to more and more exciting discoveries. And uh, you're also going to be on the Pythagoras Trousers show this month to talk more about this, aren't you? Yeah, so the, the Pythagoras of Trousers radio show, is a, a, I do a monthly astronomy item on that. Uh, and I, I, as part of that, I, I chatted to a few of the, the Cambridge scientists involved with Planck about this discovery and what it could mean. It was fascinating to hear what the, what they had to say. So that's mm-hmm. at pythagoras-trousers.co.uk. And there'll be an extended version uh, on our uh, Cardiff University website, uh, on our outreach site. So if you go to blogs.cf.ac.uk slash physics outreach, uh, there'll be a, a blog post there about an extended version of that interview, which uh, um, I'm actually I'm just putting it together right now. So <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll look forward to that. Yeah, go and check that out. Well, that's a great place to end. Uh, Dr. Chris North, thanks for speaking to us again on Awesome Astronomy. Thank you. And we'll see you again in a couple of weeks at AstroCamp. Uh, you will indeed, yeah.
And now it's time for the question and answer session, the part of the show where you are in control and you put the questions to us. So our first question um, comes from Lee Garner from Norwich in the UK um, at Cosmic Beach via Twitter. And he asks, a question for you, my tentacled friends. Like that. <laughs> are transient lunar phenomena real? If yes, what could they be? Many thanks. Tentacled friends like that. And that's a good question, Lee. Now, if you ask Paul, he'll give you an answer that includes a word that sounds a lot like tentacles. But my overarching answer would be, I've not seen one. I don't personally know anyone reliable who reports seeing one. But I've got no reason to dismiss them entirely. So are you going to start by explaining what they are? Yeah, sure. These are flashes of light that lots of people have claimed to have seen on the moon. They've been reported by amateur astronomers for centuries as lights of all colours, blurry regions or even brief dimming of normal illumination in regions on the moon. Even the crew of Apollo 11 report spotting something that fits the admittedly very wide description of transient lunar phenomena, or TLP, near Aristarchus Crater as they began lunar orbit in July 1969, and the term itself was coined by Patrick Moore the year before in a NASA report that he contributed to. And as you'd expect, because they've not been conclusively explained or even satisfactorily verified as genuine sightings in many cases, they do allow a fair bit of woo to creep in. So there is a fringe that suggests it's evidence for aliens or secret military experiments on the moon. All nonsense, but there are better testable theories, such as the large asteroid impacts which have been observed on the moon and do create flashes of light when they hit the lunar surface with the impact of numerous hydrogen bombs. But over time, you'd expect to see roughly as many of these hit the shaded area of the moon as those in sunlight, but this appears not to be the case. Anyone with a telescope in their backyard would easily see these standing out against the darkness given the frequency of TLP reports if this were the case. In fact, the only credible observations of TLP in the shaded phases of the Moon have been detected by NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center using very sensitive low-light cameras. Interestingly though, hundreds of these visually imperceptible flashes have been detected. So we turn now to Paul's astronomy hero, the genius William Herschel, who also reported seeing red glowing spots in the dark portion of the moon in 1787, which naturally added more weight to the existence of such phenomena, but he thought they were volcanoes, which we now know they couldn't have been because the moon isn't geologically active enough. But the most supported hypothesis for TLP, though, remains the venting of gas from the lunar subsurface, particularly radon gas during moonquakes. In itself, something that would modify the scientific consensus based on good evidence from the Apollo experiments on the lunar surface and geological analysis that suggests that the moon is too cold and geologically inactive for significant moonquakes to occur on such a frequent basis as appears to have been observed. So we can definitely say that people are either mistaken for a significant proportion of TLP sightings or they're making them up. Almost certainly, but there is serious professional research being conducted into this by NASA and Columbia University, both feeling that transient lunar phenomena do exist, and are most likely a combination of outgassing and impacts, and both suspecting, like you say, more events are being reported than have actually been seen. And while I don't have a take on this of my own, transient lunar phenomena does appear to be a victim of having a name that sounds, well, very pseudoscientific. It has a wide range of reported effects that are unlikely to all be real even if there was a likely known cause for many of these sightings and then of course any effect will be given a bad name by identifying demonstrably fake reports so i'll give the final word to the department of astronomy at columbia university and they say because the evidence for TLPs is almost entirely anecdotal and based on visual descriptions by observers, many scientists remain sceptical as to whether or not TLPs are real. We too were sceptical when we began our investigations of TLPs, but our statistical analyses suggest that most reported TLP events are real, even though there are some spurious reports. And as both the British Astronomical Association's Lunar Section and the Society for Popular Astronomy welcome any sketches or images taken by amateurs of any flashes of light on the moon that might be considered transient lunar phenomena, if you see any, Lee, send them in and do your bit to help solve this riddle or put it to bed once and for all. Right, a load of tentacles then. Anyway, on to our next question, which comes from Earthling Lee Jalowek via our Facebook group. And Lee asks, if popular sci-fi films are to be believed, then what happens at the event horizon of a mahoosive black hole will appear to be frozen in time to us? So how can we hope to observe one eating up gas clouds? Paul. 
A good question. Um, black holes are such a great object to talk about, and of course this is where many of those relativistic effects that Einstein talked about really come into their own. So, first off, what is a black hole? Well, in some respects, the name adds a great deal of mystery to these objects that isn't really necessary. Um, there certainly aren't holes, and in some respects, um, as we shall see, black isn't really a great description. In simple terms, a black hole is a stellar remnant and part of the great spectrum of star types that begin with protostars, works through the main sequence, um, and then the various types of giant, and ends with white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes. Formation and size are a fascinating area of research, and I'm not going to get into it too much here, but suffice to say that your common or garden variety black hole is a result of the death of a massive star, and is made of the super dense core that is left behind after a large supernova. So, this remnant is so dense that it generates a gravity, or warpage of space-time, if we're going to be more correct, that is so strong that famously light does not have enough energy to escape, and the point around the black hole where this happens, where gravity overcomes light, is known as the event horizon. Now my favourite way of thinking about this point of no return that even light can't overcome is to imagine a waterfall. Now if you swim in a slow moving river you can swim where you like. Um, swim close to a waterfall and you'll have to swim harder to move away from it. As you place yourself closer and closer you'll have to swim harder and harder to prevent yourself from being swept over. But there of course there's a point where the speed of the water and the pull of the waterfall will be greater than your ability to swim away from it and you won't be able to prevent yourself from going over. Um, and that's analogous to the event horizon, the point where the gravity around a black hole is greater than the ability of energy to overcome it. I've not heard that analogy before, but that is a really good one. You like that? Mm. Now to the relativity bit. Uh, when we look at time and its measurement, what Einstein's relativity says is that there's no consistent universal frame of reference. That the time one person reads or measures is not necessarily the same as somebody else's. And when high speeds and large mass is put into the mix, then it's definitely the case that the passage of time measured at the surface of the Earth, for instance, is not the same as that measured in space, even if the clock started out in the same place. Now, clocks at high speed or in the presence of large mass appear to an outside observer to be running more slowly, so a clock falling towards a black hole would appear to slow down, technically to a point where it appears to be taking an infinite amount of time, essentially frozen in time. Now, this is called gravitational time dilation, um, and is a well-recorded phenomenon, even on Earth. Um, there's a difference, as we said, between the measurement of time in space and on Earth's surface. Um, this effect, it must be remembered, is not noticed by the person in the observed position. So, if you imagine a person holding that clock as it falls into the black hole, time would appear to pass perfectly normal for them, and it would be the outside observer that would appear to be living through an accelerated time. So... First of all, would we see a frozen image of our poor clock-bearing black hole explorer frozen in time? Sadly, no. It's a nice idea, but it ignores another effect of the time dilation that the light emitted would be red-shifted. Uh, this red shift would increase along with the slowing of time. Um, eventually, before the event horizon is reached, the light would be so red-shifted that you would no longer see it. So, at that point, where time appears to freeze, our poor astronaut would actually just appear to vanish. So that means that the light's getting stretched out so that it's moving more towards the infrared and out of the visible spectrum. Very cool. It's very cool, isn't it? So, yeah, the, it's a lovely idea. In, in, in principle, it's correct that the astronaut freezes in time, but unfortunately, it's redshifted, you would never see it. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they'd sort of vanish into the black hole just, you know, just by getting redder and redder. Yeah. So it's worth mentioning, just for the sheer gory delights as well, that the astronaut um, wouldn't survive. <laughs> <laughs> the differences in gravity between different parts of his body uh, would be so great as to they would tear him apart at the molecular level. The clock wouldn't survive either. Um, now, the gas cloud. All the current theories and observations of black holes suggest they are surrounded by an accretion disk of gas and dust. Um, with something so massive, there's going to be a lot of hoovering up of, of dust and debris, and, um, and gas will accumulate around the black hole. Now, like the astronaut, the dust will experience the same relativistic effects and, of course, be red-shifted close to the event horizon. But further out, this disk will be spinning at quite high speeds and will generate large amounts of heat and light energy through constant collision and friction of the particles. The irony is that current theories point to black holes potentially being one of the brightest objects in the universe. Not the object itself, this is because it's, it's hidden behind the event horizon, but the disk around them is probably a great source of light and heat. So, in short, frozen astronaut, no. Big, bright, accreted dust cloud, yes. And well done for going through that without using the word spaghettification. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> Not going to use it.
And so that's that's almost all we've got time for. But of course, there's the important matter of the prize draw. The awesome astronomy prize draw with the European Southern Observatory. Indeed. And we have had a lot of entries. Yes, we have. We, we, we are sitting in a sea of names. And poor Damien's had to put all of these emails that came in into mm. the random number generator. It yeah. took him by, absolutely ages to by do By hand. Yeah. By hand. He had to write them out by hand mm. because we made him. And we broke the printer. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're going to draw. So if, if, if Ralph gives it a good stir... There are a lot of entries in here. Right, okay, I'm putting the hand in, and let's have a look at oh, that it's one there. In. There yep. it, comes. it comes. And the name says Louise Dean. Well done, you. You De- won. Louise Dean in the UK. Congratulations. In, you've won the European Southern Observatory goodie bag. And we'll send that out to you in the post, and you should have it in, well, you might even have it already. Yeah. Right then, so well done, Louise Dean. And just before we go, um, a couple of messages. Yeah, we're getting more than a little excited now because we're just only a few weeks away from Astro Camp, mm-hmm. the astronomy weekend that the podcast crew here run twice a year in the International Dark Sky Reserve of the Welsh Brecon Beacons. We've got Chris Lintot giving a talk. Damien will be giving planetary imaging tutorials. Pat Franks is taking people through DSLR deep sky imaging. Eric Ems is holding a solar observing gathering on the Sunday. Jules Wright's promised another big picnic on the Monday. And if past events are anything to go by, we'll be giving away at least one telescope in an astronomy pub quiz. And in addition to it being solar maximum still, when you can look through lots of solar scopes at sunspots, solar flares and the broiling surface of the sun, we're getting really excited at the opportunity to look at Jupiter and Mars just by our opposition and the ringed world Saturn too. So it's something of a solar and planetary spectacular this month. Mm, and we still have places left, so just go to www.astrocamp.org.uk and book your place for the 26th to the 29th of April and either share your scope with us or take a look through our scopes. We especially encourage beginners to join us, so it doesn't matter if you don't have a scope of your own, there are plenty around for you to enjoy between beating off our attempts at world domination. And you can chat away with Chris Lintot and Chris North from the BBC's Sky at Night team, and Jenny Millard, who you heard earlier in the show. And if you really want to punish yourselves, we'll be there all weekend to chat with too. Yeah, it's become such a nice and friendly gathering, and I'm going to pat ourselves on the back, but it's really such a fun event that we've created here so we'd love you to join us there and you can also hear us on the excellent 365 days of astronomy podcast and astronomy fm do stop by our twitter feed at awesome astro pod or our facebook group and our google plus site too our next transmission will be the may sky guide that we'll have ready for you to download via itunes or the rss feed just a couple of days before the start of may the video that Damien slaves over will come out a few days before that, and you can find that on the Awesome Astronomy YouTube channel. And finally, to play us out, it's thanks to Dan and Dan Films, and in honour of the Daily Mail's use for raw images without permission, their regurgitation of alternative medicines and pseudoscience, and scaremongering on issues abhorrent to all well-intentioned people, and their seeming desire to write about certain people only being used as experts due to a liberal agenda, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. <laughs> Royals on the first page, swine flu and road rage Fine laddie, foreign baddie, put him in a big cage Bureaucratic red tape, Facebook gang rape Gordon out, Dave in before the country caves in Ian Huntley gets his own jacuzzi and a gym in jail It's absolutely true because I read it in the Daily Mail Bring back capital punishment for paedophiles Photo feature on schoolgirls, skirt styles Binge Britain, single mums, pensioners Hoodie scum, oversexed and underage Foreign stories, half a page Criminals get marked suspensive vouchers When released on bail It's absolutely true because I read it in the Daily Mail Ban this gay smart, I'm not racist, but car crime, knife crime, hang the cheating wife time, pop stars take drugs, teen boys wear hoods, sports stars have sex, bear shit in woods, Brussels politicians want to stop us drinking English ale. It's absolutely true because I read it in the Daily Mail. 
climb the gate, petrol prices pop holes, credit crisis, gypsies, Russell Brand, time we all took a stand, modern art, where to start, trashed a lot of it, apart from statuette, a puppy, 50 quid was B&B, Muslim women hiding stolen goods behind their veil. It's absolutely true because I read it in the Daily Mail. Poles paid to give blood, immigration like a flood, soft touch, British arse, cancer from your mobiles, cancer from your laptop, cancer from your root crop, cancer from your shoes, from your dog, from your pen top, immigrants arriving on an unprecedented scale. It's got to be the case if it's written in the Daily Mail. They never mince their words in the good old Daily Mail. It's absolutely true, because I gather all my views from the Daily Mail. Thanks, Dan. Nice one. I'm just going to go and wash my hands, I think. I would if I were you.